Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for getting a relatively tall podium uh, as well. I am the tallest senator, I don't know if you mentioned this, in the history of, <laughs> history of the Senate. It's not on my bio, but it's just a little uh, color for you there. Uh, I really uh, want to thank you again for having me. I want to introduce my son who's sitting here in the front row. He uh, looks exactly like me, except a little bit, a lot younger and better looking and smarter and all that. But uh, uh, he works at the American Enterprise Institute in uh, Washington and uh, strategic studies and affairs. And you never know, maybe someday he'll be able to come back and talk about those issues. Um, as I say, it's a great honor to be back today, to be here today and talk about my time in the arena as uh, one of our former presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, would have said, as he would have put it. I don't think he ever spoke here at the Union, but he did speak here in Oxford. And I've always used his uh, great speech about the man in the arena. If you haven't read it or if you're not familiar with it, I uh, commend it to you. I should start off uh, my remarks by letting you know that I got a lot of my early preparation for politics here in the UK. Um, after college at Tulane University in New Orleans, I uh, uh, came to Aberdeen, Scotland, to work on an oil fill supply ship in the North Sea. So many of you are from Scotland. I probably have been to Aberdeen. I know someone who lives there uh, we talked to earlier. Uh, how is that good preparation for politics? Well, if you've never seen the North Sea, it's a bleak, dark, thank you, <laughs> harsh, unforgiving, unpredictable uh, environment, which is really perfect uh, training for uh, American politics uh, these days. Uh, lots of times I would have rather been on that boat uh, during my political career. Uh, not many, uh, but a few. Well, uh, we meet today at a time when the ties that are binding us uh, in our country and across the world are fraying across the, the Western democracies. We're seeing more and more politicians whose rhetoric matches a belief among some people that political struggles are not just fights between good faith opponents who might disagree, but rather between the forces of good and evil. Now it creates, uh, instead of, you know, when you lose an election these days, unfortunately, instead of just a loss that creates what would normally be expected, the loyal opposition, a loss in politics creates the resistance, conjuring absurd comparisons between duly elected government and the life and death struggles of everyday citizens against the Nazi occupation during the darkest days of World War II. So today I want to talk a little bit about how we got here how we can get back to the civil discourse that has defined Western democracy and what we risk if we don't do that. I'll provide some insights from my time as Alabama's Attorney General and United States Senator, and I'll share some predictions, some hopes, and some aspirations regarding the future of American politics. And I'll look forward to a little dialogue and some questions uh, at the conclusion of these uh, brief remarks. I'm gonna to speak today from the perspective of a traditional uh, conservative, maybe just a conservative as is normally known, dealing with two shock waves currently running throughout U.S. politics. Roy Moore's style of populist extremism on the far right and the Doug Jones style wave of liberal enthusiasm we saw from the left in my home state of Alabama. This phenomenon is not really unique to America or to Alabama. It mirrors what we see going on around the world. And as I was thinking about this and preparing these remarks, uh, I came across an observation that I've come to really appreciate from one of our former presidents, Ulysses S. Grant. He said, President Grant said, as he was thinking about his memoirs, that my later experience has taught me two lessons. First, that things are seen plainer after the events have occurred. Second, that the most confident critics are generally those who know least about the matter criticized. Now, a private citizen, after a decade in the political trenches, I guess I'm a recovering politician, I can attest to the truth in both of those observations. Let's talk about American politics. In my experience, you generally find two types of people, not necessarily conservatives and liberals or Republicans and Democrats, but rather people who want to get things done and people who want to complain about things not getting done. On the Republican side, we'll have what I call constructive uh, or results-oriented conservatives versus rhetorical conservatives. In the current political environment, rhetorical conservatives get lots of attention. 
They recognize, as we probably all do, that the way to get attention, today's world on social media, the more likes, the more mentions, the more retweets, the more uh, social media uh, observations is to be as radical or as provocative as possible. There's very little reward, and I can attest to this from my own personal experience, for any kind of compr uh, compromise or moderation uh, in our politics today. We have lots of Republicans in uh, America who are very good at this type of rhetoric, but conversely, they have very few actual conservative accomplishments to show for it. The great irony, of course, is that the rhetorical conservatives are the very mirror image of the rhetorical liberals that they despise. Both reject moderation, both reject compromise, both view the other as the enemy who must be defeated at all costs. And as they drive the wedge of division deeper and deeper, they both begin to view compromise not only as something to be avoided, but indeed a traitorous act. Making common ground becomes treason. Working together equals conspiring with the enemy. On the other hand, and I think this is the optimistic message, there's a category I'll put myself in. Those are the results-oriented conservatives who, in order to actually get things done, recognize the need to work with others. You might call them constructive conservatives, seeking through an approach that unites rather than divides to build something that can last generations. It's an approach we've seen work time and time again since the very beginning of the American experiment. After all, our great American system was established by many compromises at every turn in its formation. In my farewell remarks to the Senate, I singled out one in particular, the Connecticut Compromise. It established a house based on rep, uh, population uh, numbers, and it established a Senate based on fixed numbers. Without that compromise and the spirit of goodwill that informed it, there would be no Constitution and no United States of America as we know it. Channeling that tradition when I served as Attorney General, I put my constructive conservatism to work for the state, and I want to give you just two or three examples of how I went about that. Sometimes it meant working together with other states and members of the political parties, other political parties, to get things done. The Deepwater Horizon disaster stands out in my mind as a time we had to do just that. You may recall, uh, you're not too young to remember, that in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, killed 11 people, and became the largest marine oil spill in history. Uh, upon my taking office, I made justice for our Gulf of Mexico my top priority. And to do that, I had to work with other political leaders, Republicans and Democrats, throughout the Gulf Coast to put aside our differences and present a unified front to the court uh, and in the litigation that followed. I was very fortunate that the court appointed me the coordinating counsel for the five Gulf Coast states, so I was able to be in the courtroom. I personally tried the case and we reached a landmark settlement that compensated the entire Gulf for over $60 billion and several billion dollars for our state of Alabama for both economic and environmental damages caused by that disaster. It was a conservative solution uh, because, uh, just for an example of conservative approach, I used our, offices, our own great lawyers in the Attorney General's Office of Alabama instead of going out and hiring an outside law firm to do the work that I thought we were capable of doing, that we were being paid to do, by our citizens, and that resulted in a savings of almost $140, $50 million in legal fees for our citizens. And in a state like Alabama, that's a lot of money that can be used for things that are necessary for our government. Sometimes constructive conservatism means putting aside your party ties to enforce the law consistently and impartially. That's an important conservative message. I'd like to see more of that kind of cooperation. Secondly, to have faith in their elected officials and representatives, citizens need to know that, they, that someone, someone in government is keeping those elected officials honest. 99.9% .9 of elected officials are honest. It's the few that aren't who create uh, the problems and discourage people about the uh, people and the system uh, governing them. So upon taking office as Attorney General, I formed the very best state special prosecutions team in the country. In my time in office, we convicted dozens of public officials. We impeached a sheriff, for, which was unprecedented in Alabama, for human and drug trafficking. And most significantly, we convicted the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the state of Alabama and the most powerful member of my own party. 
As you might imagine, that conviction created many enemies in the state's political hierarchy for me, enemies who would work hard uh, against me while I was both attorney general and then uh, in my campaign in the Senate. And finally, sometimes constructive conservatism means fighting back against the other party and its overreach. That's perfectly legitimate and a fundamental function of our government to be the opposition, if you will, as you might put it here in, uh, in the UK. So when I took office, you'll recall, uh, in 2011, President Obama had been in office for two years and embarked on an agenda that my colleagues, my Republican colleagues and I, uh, felt pushed the limits of executive power and exceeded his authority under our separation of powers doctrine in the United States, where we have a clearly defined executive, legislative, and judicial branch that are all independent. Um, oftentimes he proposed legislation and it was defeated, uh, and then he decided to circumvent it through regulation, which I sometimes refer to as the fourth branch of government in our country. Um, he said famously, I've got a pen and a phone and I'm going to proceed with my initiatives. And he kept that promise. So as attorneys general, and we had at the time I was attorney general, 28 of the 50 attorneys general in the country, uh, we fought back. We called ourselves the last line of defense uh, and we took the president to court uh, to uh, define his authority and jurisdiction in many of these areas. Uh, we did it. Um, as uh, our role as attorneys general, we didn't engage in violence, we didn't take to the streets, we didn't call the president the enemy of the people, we just felt he was wrong and used our existing system to make our case and took him to court. And so uh, I'm glad uh, we were very fortunate, uh, but on issues from health care to EPA initiatives, religious liberty, and on and on, we uh, won in court um, and uh, ultimately led to my becoming the chairman of the Republican Attorneys General Association and an officer in the National Aging Association, which is a bipartisan group. It's a very important part and more important every day of our uh, government. As a matter of fact, something to keep your eye on in the elections in the United States uh, next week, a week from today, is the, uh, are the prospects of a couple of attorneys general who are running for higher office, uh, one being um, uh, Bill Schuette, he's running for the governorship of, Mississippi, of, of uh, Michigan, but the other being, a, uh, especially interesting to me, Josh Hawley, who is the Attorney General of Missouri, which is a very, uh, um, it's a bellwether state, it's very hard to predict how things will go there. He's the Attorney General uh, there, he's re been recruited, he's running against um, an incumbent, Claire McCaskill, in a very close race. And I'm predicting right here tonight that he's going to win that election, uh, but it'll be very close. Speaking of elections, let's turn now to the uh, uh, election of 2016 and what that led to. President Trump was elected, everything uh, changed in our country. Uh, I'm gonna leave uh, the reasons for President Trump's election uh, aside for the moment, uh, for another day, perhaps for another speaker. But if you ask me, I'll simply observe that I think President Trump won because he simply spoke to millions of Americans who felt left out who felt like they've been, they had been left behind. Saw growing wealth and power, primarily on our coast and our cities with elites, high CEO salaries and so forth in their own towns. Uh, stores were drying up, factories had been closing. And he was the first person in a long time that they felt like understood what they were going through. And that's why so many people voted for President, who voted even for President Obama in 2012, voted for President Trump in 2016, which is a surprising um, statistic uh, that I was interested to, to learn as I went back and looked at that election. So in the wake of that election, I was faced with a tough decision. And these are the kind of decisions you have to make when you're in political life um, uh, all the time. I'd been attorney general for six years, and my friend Jeff Sessions, who's now, of course, the attorney general of the United States, had been a senator for 20 years, decided to leave the Senate uh, to go to work as, uh, in the Department of Justice as attorney general. As you, as you may recall, he had been one of the first conservative senators uh, to endorse President Trump. So he was uh, recruited to do that. I decided to run for Senator Sessions' seat in the Senate. So I declared my candidacy, raised uh, quite a bit of money, and was the only candidate declared and running uh, for the seat. Then the governor of Alabama at the time offered me the interim appointment to serve in the seat until the election could be held on the re next regularly scheduled election, which would be next week a two-year interim appointment, which was the tradition in these sort of situations. 
I was in a, a quandary. Uh, the governor was embroiled in an ethics investigation, and that investigation was led in part by the very anti-corruption team I had put together. And I knew how it would look to some people, particularly people who didn't like me very much if I took the appointment. I also believed I was the best person for the position that the people of Alabama and around the country needed more constructive, conservative voices in the Senate. But there's one thing I knew for sure though, and I wasn't going to take the appointment unless I was certain that the person who would replace me would have the same commitment to fighting corruption that I had made the cornerstone of my time in office. When I learned that if I were to take the position in the Senate, a sitting district attorney who was known for his honesty and his ethics, Steve Marshall, would replace me, I felt comfortable moving forward. I'm proud to report that while I was serving in the Senate, Marshall continued the ethics investigation into the governor to its conclusion, and just as I knew he would, uh, justice was done. Eventually, the governor was forced to resign. Steve's now on his way to um, an election in his own right as the Attorney General of Alabama uh, on Tuesday. Unfortunately, now, for me, personally, and ultimately for the state, and I think for the country, the new governor decided to move the election up from November of 18, next week, to November of 2017. That meant I'd be campaigning in the middle of a political environment unlike any we had ever seen before, reminiscent of some of the worst storms in the North Sea uh, during my time there. I'll go ahead and spoil the story for you, but I'm sure you know that I lost to Roy Moore, an extremist populist who had been removed for his conduct not once, but twice from the Alabama Supreme Court. He had no discernible policy objectives, no agenda. He was the kind of man to quote Alfred from the Batman movies who just wanted to watch the world burn. <laughs> then in a stunner that anyone, anyone could have been able to see co coming, Moore turned around and lost to his liberal democratic challenger, Doug Jones. I've known Doug Jones for a long time. He was a prosecutor uh, and we've uh, worked together as lawyers for probably 30 years. Such an outcome uh, would have been unimaginable under any other circumstances. In the wake of that result, Matt Drudge, one of the last great independent journalists in America, summed it up in a tweet, which is how we communicate important things these days. He said, Luther Strange would have won in a landslide. Just too much crazy and nerve wracking times. There is a limit. We'll see if he's right or not. Uh, so where'd all that crazy come from? It didn't start with election on two, tw the election night in 2016, but that night supercharged it. It's hard to imagine what Democratic voters felt like on election night. Literally the day before, they had been given a 99% chance of winning. Hillary Clinton felt so confident that on her October 26, 2016 birthday, she tweeted out a picture of herself as a little girl, writing, happy birthday to this future president. Then the election came. The people voted and the Democrats' worst nightmare was realized. Not only had they lost, but they had lost to the man who embodied everything they hated, Donald Trump. Some people pledged their opposition, which is expected and perfectly in keeping with our traditions. But others lost their minds. Trump and the Republicans who supported him were immoral, evil, and beneath contempt. Even elected leaders in the Democratic Party started urging their supporters to harass Republicans, and even some began to use the rhetoric of violence. The media joined in, further inflaming the views of some on the right, that the press is the arm and arm of the Democratic Party, and the term fake news became omnipresent. The response on the right was expected, if disappointing. Radicalism was met with radicalism. Many conservatives retreated to their own corners, becoming more rhetorically populist, less willing to work with Democrats or even moderate Republicans, and more willing to engage in the same kind of hate-filled politics that they claimed to despise on the left. They saw enemies everywhere, including in their own party. Steve Bannon, remember him, <laughs> one of President Trump's key advisors at the time of my election, bucked his own boss to go after Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Senate. That's the same Mitch McConnell who fought to hold open a Supreme Court seat for President Trump to fill, who passed the largest tax reform package in history, and who just went to war to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. But because Mitch McConnell supported me, 
Bannon felt I had to be defeated, even if it meant supporting someone like Roy Moore. Roy Moore's victory was fueled by anger and rage on the right. But while anger and rage may win primaries, it's not always enough to win general elections. So for the first time since the 1980s, Alabama has a Democratic senator. Now some aspirations and some observations. I quoted uh, President Grant earlier about how it's only when your great events and struggles, the great events and struggles of your life are over that you come to have some clarity on what really happened and sometimes what went wrong. And that's definitely true of an election. It's hard to have perspective when you're in the middle of the fight, but defeat has a way of clarifying things for you. It certainly did for me. And one of the great traditions of the Senate is the farewell speech. It's an opportunity to tell your colleagues what you've learned, sometimes share some lessons with them on things that they might be missing in the middle of their struggles. There's a room just off the Senate floor called the Marble Room. It's likely you've never heard of it, but there was a time in American history where a few spaces were more important. It was a place where the normal partisanship of the Capitol was absent. It was the one place where senators of all stripes could come and catch their breath after the debates in a long day, take off their armor. Some would take a nap, some would eat lunch, but all would end up forming bonds that rose above politics. Today, I observed in my time there, the marble room is nearly always empty. This emptiness, I believe, symbolizes everything that's wrong with today's politics. It's likely both a symptom and a cause of the partisan gridlock that often uh, dominates American life. See, the United States Senate was designed to accommodate conflict and profound disagreement, profound disagreement. It was in that Senate where decisions were made that reforged our country after America's bloody civil war. It was in the Senate that leaders put politics aside to defeat the rise of fascism in Europe and guided the creation of a new 20th century world order. It was in the Senate where long, long overdue support for civil rights was won, vote by vote. The Senate was designed to overcome grave political difficulties. It was not, however, designed to tolerate the entrenched factionalism that dominates today's politics. It was not designed to overcome the growing sense that our political opponents are our mortal enemies. And it's not only an American problem. I won't just pick on America. The same type of division we're seeing in Washington is too often seen in London, Paris, Berlin, and all the capitals of the Western world. It's a tide of division that we must drive back. But how do we do that? I think about the first thing we can serve, I think the first thing we conservatives have to do is get our own house in order. I spoke earlier about the division between constructive conservatives and rhetorical conservatives. To borrow a line from a great American president, we need to tear down that wall. American, uh, we need to tear down that wall. Ronald Reagan knew a thing about, too about tearing down walls. I was pleased to see his picture earlier here in this wonderful place. He was someone whose commitment to getting things done was matched by his ability to explain to the American people through the power of rhetoric why those things needed to happen. He was someone who could speak passionately about the evil empire of the Soviet Union and yet meet with Gorbachev and hammer out unprecedented arms reduction treaties. He was someone who gave the Democratic opponents hell with his humor and wit, yet he could work with Democratic members of Congress to pass landmark mark historic tax cuts and reforms. Think about this. The Republican Party never controlled the Congress while Reagan was president. Not even close. There were times when Democrats had as much as a hundred seat majority in the House of Representatives. Yet, when Reagan came into office, the top tax rate in America was 70%. When he left, it was 28%. It's almost impossible to imagine that kind of thing getting done today. Simply put, we need more Reagans. I saw Reagan's ability to bring people together firsthand. I was a student at Tulane coming to an event very similar to this at my university in New Orleans when Governor Reagan, then Governor Reagan, came to speak at our school. He encountered a hostile audience of students, one not eager to hear what he had to say. And it's hard to picture the 
conflict in your mind that it was going on in the late 60s and early 70s in the United States of America surrounding the Vietnam War and many other issues that we were facing then. But he engaged the concerns of the students and explained why his views were uh, right and they were perhaps misguided. I can't say he won over everyone uh, uh, that day, but I can say, and what impressed me the most, was that he earned their respect, uh, which was a great uh, start. Now it's true uh, that Reagan was a rhetorical uh, genius, but he was more than that. He could easily have used his talents and skills and done the easy thing. He could have just used his rhetoric to stir up division, inflame passions, divide people, pit people uh, against themselves, but that's not what he did. Reagan believed in the things he said and the positions he supported, and he believed in them enough to do the hard work, selling them, explaining them, fighting for them. And because of that, more than just his words live on. <clears throat> his deeds do too. But only because he was willing to step out and work with others to build a legacy that would last. And our challenge now in this current environment is to do the same. So I conclude my remarks uh, to you today with the words of another American president, Abraham Lincoln. He was an American president, but like Britain's own Winston Churchill, he was a man for all ages and for the world. In his first inaugural address, as the winds of war were blowing across our country, this is what he said. He said, I, he said we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will swell when again touched as surely as they will be by the better angels of our nature. We need those better angels again. They're found in each and every one of us. They live in those with whom we agree and with whom we disagree. Together, we have built a world of unparalleled freedom and prosperity. There's much work left to do and we cannot do it alone. I look forward to taking your questions and talking about how we can all do that together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. I just want to pick up on a few of the things that you mentioned before we hand over to the audience. So firstly, about your time as Attorney General, mm -hmm. I'm interested to see why there was such a problem with corruption in the first place. I know you said it was only a small percentage of elected officials, but why was it that Alabama state and local politics had this problem? Was it worse in Alabama than other states? Well, and probably not. I think human nature being what it is, it's an issue across the board. I think in Alabama, you could point to two things. Uh, one, uh, when uh, the, well, two, I would say, simply put, one, there was not enough pros uh, prosecution or attention paid to public corruption. So until I came into office, federal government was not making it a priority. And um, we had to create a team that would actually take it seriously. Uh, so number one, we were finding more because we made it a priority. Secondly, I think one party rule sometimes tends to uh, foster these kind of issues. Uh, we fought very hard in Alabama to uh, take control of the government. Uh, it had been controlled by Democrats since the Civil War, post-Civil War time. And in, 19, uh, in 2011, the Alabama Republican Party took over both houses of the legislature for the first time in a hundred and something years. Sometimes when you have one party rule, the party gets complacent, people get lax on their rules. I guess maybe I'd add one other thing. We didn't have a robust ethics law and you need to have that. And we passed one. And then to the shock of some of the people that we ended up dealing with, we actually enforced it. And, uh, <laughs> and that's when, you know, so uh, I don't think there's any more corruption necessarily in Alabama than anywhere else. You can go to any state. It's just a matter of enforcing it. And the more you enforce it, uh, people uh, realize they have to uh, follow the rules. They tend to not push them. I want to ask next about the distinction you drew between constructive and rhetorical conservatism. Um, you know, when you ran uh, in the Senate primary, you accepted the endorsement of President Trump. You wore a Make America Great Again hat. Uh, to what extent do you think that divides you from those who you label as rhetorical conservatives? Do you not worry that that's the, that, that, that symbolism and that endorsement is actually amplifying the power of rhetorical conservatives within this movement? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I, I don't view uh, Trump as a, uh, or that situation as, as, as rhetorical, although certainly he's a rhetorical showman, you know, as president. 
he's actually been quite constructive in terms of his accomplishing the things he set out to accomplish. So think about the three things that he promised to do when he was elected, at least three. Uh, one was to uh, pass tax reform, lower tax rates. He did that. One was to, to uh, lift the regulatory state that had been imposed on, on Alabama, I mean, on the country, individuals and businesses and so forth. Overregulation, as, as he would say, that's been lifted. And then the third thing he promised to do was to put conservative judges on the courts. So he's actually uh, been accomplishing things. Sometimes you can imagine if he didn't tweet at all or actually get out and, and do the things he likes to do and just focused on his record, it would be quite conservative uh, as far as that goes. Um, my contrast with people in Alabama were like the people I was running against. Roy Moore doesn't have any accomplishments, you know, he's, but he's quite rhetorical and very good at uh, revving up his crowds, his, his little group. Uh, but I couldn't point to anything that he's ever done, accomplished that's conservative. One of my other opponents, a uh, congressman from North Alabama, same way, had been in government for 30 years, very much a rhetorical person, can give a great speech on conservatism, but if you look at his record, nothing really to show for it. I want to ask a question about that rhetoric. There are some, you know, particularly on the left, uh, in some of the newspapers as well, who would say that the sort of rhetoric that President Trump and people like Steve Bannon have promoted has actually led to a growing sentiment of racism, of xenophobia. Um, do you think that the president has been irresponsible in his language? Well, I'd certainly like for him to tone it down. Um, you know, in the Senate, uh, it's not helpful. You know, we're, we're trying to get things done, and the president just has a tendency to tweet and comment. Uh, I don't believe he's a racist, uh, but I do con I'm concerned now. You know, we've seen, I mean, I think we all are concerned about the rhetoric on all sides. I am. I, I witnessed the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings uh, before that. Leaders on both sides. And I'm hoping after the week we've had in America with the bombs left with certain candidate, you know, Democratic figures and with the shooting at the tragic shooting at the synagogue just a few days ago that all politicians, especially President Trump, will recognize that words matter and, uh, and inflaming that is not constructive at all. So I'm hoping we're going to see a dial back on all fronts. Sure. And in terms of the distinction between state and national politics and national elections, do you feel that because your election was a special by-election, mm -hmm. it received you know, undue national interest? that perhaps meant that the focus was not on the interests of ordinary people living in Alabama, but mm -hmm. was actually on an ideological war in the Republican Party? I, I do. I think it became a nationalized election. As soon as election day was changed, to put it in the middle of a year, the first year of President Trump, Trump's term, it would become the most, uh, it would be the one place that voters uh, could go to register their, uh, their approval or disapproval of what was going on. In Alabama, we're a very conservative state, but uh, as, as I got into uh, office, um, it became a referendum on, are you going to keep your promises? And so, if you recall, the big debate when the president took office was repealing and replacing Obamacare, our health care debate. Uh, I would have uh, not have led with that issue as the top issue to take on. I would have taken on any number of other issues. But for whatever reason, the president and the Senate leaders at the time decided we're going to ta tackle health care. It's the most complicated issue, probably, that we face in, in the U.S. Uh, and you recall the Republicans for eight years, while President Obama had been president, had promised in every campaign, in every town and village, we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare the first thing we do. Um, and there was a lot of resentment uh, against Dem Republicans for not stopping it in the first place. But when they got control uh, with Trump as president, so he controlled both houses of the Congress and the presidency, uh, it was quite dramatic. Um, there's big debate, spent a lot of time on that. Everybody who had been promised it. Then at three in the morning, you might have seen this on television, I was on the floor of the Senate. Um, it came down to one vote by one uh, man, Senator McCain, who came dramatically to the floor and did thumbs down and killed, repeal and replace. That was about three months before my election. That actually turned the polling in our race from uh, uh, leading to underwater. And we never could recover it because it became a referendum on Mitch McConnell, Came refer referendum on you promised it, but you never did it. And who could you take that out on? But the one race coming up. So we had people coming in from all over the country into our our race, and uh, that uh, that changed the dynamics around. If the uh, election had remained in 2018 next uh, week, 
I don't think it would even be uh, on, on the radar screen. Do you think that, therefore, we should interpret the election of Doug Jones to the Senate as a blip? Or do you think there is really a growing trend of uh, people, no matter their historic party affiliation, in states in the Deep South and on the Gulf Coast voting Democrat? Do you think that there is the potential for the Democratic Party to make gains in those states? I think it's highly unlikely. We'll see in a week. There are some quite interesting races in Florida and Georgia and other states uh, where Democrats are running pretty strong. Uh, it depends on what kind of candidate the Republicans offer. If they offer another Roy Moore, if Roy Moore is nominated again, they'll lose. Uh, if they uh, put a normal, um, you know, can-do Republican, and there are plenty of them across the Southeast, then they should have no trouble in winning in the Senate. Uh, you'll, we'll, we'll learn that lesson two years from now when Doug Jones is up for election and, uh, and see if he can hold on uh, to his seat. Um, I think the main lesson, and this is the lesson that uh, Mitch McConnell tried to teach the party, and uh, one of the reasons he supported me so strongly was, uh, if you remember, uh, uh, four years ago, uh, there were about four or five races that the Republicans were poised to win, but they nominated such uh, um, unelectable candidates, people who said outrageous things, took outrageous positions, uh, that they lost. About five races they never, they, they assumed they would win. And so McConnell made it a point to, to never, to try to avoid nominating an unelectable candidate. So he came to me and said, we're gonna come in and support you big time because you're electable, you've been elected twice statewide, you have a strong record. Um, of course, you know, rightfully so, I think you can understand citizens don't like to have their politicians selected. So there was a two-sided coin. People said, well, we're not gonna have Mitch McConnell pick who our senator is. So it played into the populism and the draw of Roy Moore. But what McConnell saw was what happened. There's a possibility you could lose, and that only possibility is if you nominate someone like Roy Moore who can't be elected. And of course, he's too much of a gentleman to say, I told you so, but he probably would. And, uh, but the consequence of that is, in the races that'll be decided on Tuesday night, next Tuesday night, the Republicans have nominated across the board solid, leading uh, politicians, businessmen, Mitt Romney, uh, people of that caliber across the board. So you don't have any Roy Moores running, and I think maybe the Republican Party will have learned its lesson. So you that. think Mitch McConnell has won in a battle for the establishment against Steve Bannon type people? Well, I was shocked to see Steve Bannon came out and, and, and uh, started praising uh, Mitch McConnell. And I thought, where were you last year, you know, when you were uh, uh, attacking him so severely and significantly? Um, I think now people on the Republican side and even on the far right conservative side are starting to understand that there's a, there's a bigger game here. They're just just being, giving raw meat political speeches uh, and opposing everyone. Uh, we had debates in the Senate sometimes, and uh, I don't know how you are in your normal life, but if, you get, if you're talking to your spouse or your business partner or something and they offer you 75 or 80% of what you have asked for, that's usually considered a victory. And um, that's sort of the approach I took and most of the Republicans that I was in the Senate with. But there are a few Republicans that uh, would say, well, they may be giving us 80%, but until they give us 100%, I'm against it. That essentially puts you in this, on the other side of the aisle because you're with the obstructionist or the other side if you're not going to compromise at all to achieve a goal. And that's sort of what you saw in Reagan. I can get 55%, I've won, then I'll come back again and get a little bit more. And that's sort of how the process was designed to work. When you have people, and you see it on the left too, we couldn't possibly meet with the Republicans or consider anything to do with that because we might have to give up something. Then you're in a stalemate, which is where we are today. I'd like to move to take some questions from the audience now. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand up. Let's go first to the hand here in the, uh, blue, in the blue jumper jacket. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for, for coming. My mum actually worked for BP during the Deepwater Horizon scandal, <laughs> but don't worry, that hasn't affected my opinion if you're talking. Uh, I'm sorry, I hope that no, no trouble, right. no trouble. Seems um, like they're doing okay now. So no, yeah, no, she's, she's so <laughs> fine. Um, but um, I, I thought it was, it was very powerful how you contrasted a sort of Roy Moore style figure with President Reagan. I don't know, especially um, for us in this country who, who sort of learn about him in history and the like, we see him as a figure with the ability to inspire hope. 
Um, and do you think Republicans, um, or at least the right in America, have forgotten that ability to be great communicators, to reach out and to inspire people, as well as simply sort of trot out slogans in, in opposition to the Democrats and like, and how do you bring that back? I think we do need more of that. I, I said more Reagans, but you know, Reagan was an individual. You can't have, I don't know, you'll never have another Churchill. They're just unique historic figures. But there is a, um, there's a need to come back to that uh, ability to, uh, to express your opinions respectfully and try to bring people together. I think uh, there are a couple of things that work against that. One is the social media climate that we live in and the, and the talk radio and the t televisions where ratings and everything are driven by uh, you know, uh, controversy. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to go uh, be a panelist on one of the uh, television news networks in our country, but I realized they really didn't want me to come talk about like how we're gonna solve a problem. They really just wanted me to either trash President Trump or, uh, or defend him, something controversial, you know, on some issue, which is not really what uh, I was uh, interested in doing. But we, um, we're, we're at a phase now, I'll say this about President Trump, just to keep in mind, you know, his, uh, he was very nice to support me. I didn't, you know, I didn't ask for his support. He actually, it's a kind of interesting story. He called me um, when I was driving down the highway and uh, I thought it was a joke, really. I thought it, maybe it was Borat or somebody calling me, you know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, it was President Trump on the phone. I said, oh my gosh, what can I do to help you? I wanna help you win. I said, well, you, how about a tweet? You know, that would be good. And um, that's kind of how it started, you know. I think that if he, uh, what you're seeing now is uh, he kind of got involved in my race at the very end and it became, things were sort of baked in the cake at that point. Uh, what you're seeing him do now is get it out in front of candidates he supports very early on in the process. Uh, but he's not gonna be the rhetorical Reagan. Uh, he was elected, uh, I, I'm, you know, for, for, for your generation and for the current situation, he's a disruptor like Uber and uh, any number of other new technologies. People wanted a disruptor in Washington. They had had uh, the same, and they had 16 conventional candidates to choose from and they had one disruptor and they wanted someone to come in and say, I want you to look at everything we do. How much, we're, what about the wars we're in? What about our economy? What about our trade agreements? What about the way we deal with uh, our borders, our immigration system, our healthcare? We want someone to upset the apple cart. And that's what he's doing. He's doing exactly what he said he would do. So we shouldn't be surprised, but we shouldn't expect him to change either. But I think you're going to see, I see it in the youth that I talk to, uh, people who realize that it's principles that will endure, not any particular one victory or, or not. Great, moving on to the next question. Um, let's go to the uh, hand in the white on the aisle there, please. Uh, this is Huma from Pakistan and student of public policy. Uh, you ended your speech by the Abraham Lincoln's quote that the, we are friends, not enemies. And if we see the realist perspective, they say that the states go for the maximizing their power and they go for this self-interest. Uh, if we look at the American policies on, on international level, we see there are certain policies which are based upon the national interest or we call it the self-interest. If we look at the uh, Iraq war, Afghanistan war, the second war on terror or pulling out of the climate change agreement. So how do you see or how it can be integrated the realist view of with the idealist view that we are friends, not enemies? <laughs> That's a very, very good question. and. Um, I think that the, the number one concern uh, in, the, in the main emphasis of the president has been in the foreign policy world to keep America safe. He's reevaluating whether or not our country should be involved all over the world in every single dispute that, that um, you know, we've inherited a lot of things. I'm not the foreign policy expert. I was not on the foreign affairs or foreign policy um, or intelligence committees. I wish I had been, but I think that that's what you're seeing. I think the number one concern that we have to deal with and how you address this in today's global world. You have the same issue here. Terrorism, how do we deal with that? That issue, it's very concerning to all of us. And I think uh, the president is, the one thing I'll say about it is the people that I voted on when I was in the Senate, who now are the uh, leaders of our key departments, the State Department, the Defense Department, and other key uh, players in the international world are, are good common sense people. They don't seem to have an agenda driven towards war or towards strife. They seem to be trying to, um, you know, uh, rein in some of the, the hot spots. I'll just give you one example that 
uh, and again, I'm not the policy, foreign policy expert, but the Korean Peninsula, very, very volatile, very uh, problematic relationships with China. And uh, you've seen the president make some statements that have made people nervous. But on the other hand, there are things that have never been done before. It's a way to try something different and see if you can break through. And uh, the story's yet to be written, but I'm hoping that he'll, he'll have a breakthrough uh, on those. But again, it's a way for him to test these relationships and, and understand for himself. Great, moving on to the next question. Let's go to the uh, hand here in the tweed jacket. Thank you. I think it was a Supreme Court case from your own state, Shelby County holder, that yes. undermined the Voting Rights Act. And now you mentioned it, another Attorney General uh, in Georgia, Brian Kemp, is seemingly purging um, voters from the um, voting rolls uh, up against, uh, you know, in his competition against a black progressive mm -hmm. uh, candidate. Do you not think that perhaps it's time for re-evaluation of voting rights in America. And that, uh, do you think that this, that Brian Kemp is doing is wrong? You know, that's, that's the fundamental right that so many people have fought for, the right to vote, exercise your right to vote. Alabama had a terrible record up in, through the 60s in the civil rights laws of, of either formerly, or the whole South, you know, and even in the North, restricting uh, minority voting. Uh, but since, uh, I'm proud to say our home, my home city of Birmingham, which is a famous civil rights city, is now uh, a totally different place and uh, it's made tremendous progress. The case you mentioned, the Civil Rights Act, uh, the section of the act that was overturned by the Supreme Court was not the whole act itself, but just one part of it. And it was the one part of it that was put in place uh, to make the old South, Southern Confederate, if you will, states of the old confederacy go through an extra hoop every time they wanted to change anything to do with voting they had to go to the justice department and say we want to change the voting from here in this library to across the street you'd have to go to the justice department and say is that okay the other states of the union didn't have to do that and over time statistically in terms of any kind of discrimination or anything there was really no difference between those states and the northern states in terms of restrictions or any kind of problems. So uh, the Southern states and the Supreme Court agreed should no longer be singled out, especially if everybody's gonna have to go ask for special permission. If the South is, then everybody should. But, you can, but it didn't do away with the uh, Strong Voting Rights Act that protects people's right to vote. The situation in Georgia, uh, I'm not familiar with it, but there have been time to time there have been claims that there's tremendous amount of voting fraud and so forth. I don't think there's been much evidence that there's a lot of voting fraud in the United States, um, but you have to guard against it. You know, there have been several elections in America that have been decided by just a handful of votes, you know. So the right to vote and to make sure the right people vote is really important. But using it against a racial group or anything is totally wrong, and if that's going on, um, I don't think that'll stand. I don't know enough about it to say. I know in our state we have a very aggressive uh, Secretary of State who's been out purging voting list, and when you say purge, it just means people who are dead or moved and make sure it's up to date. And so that's the important part of democracy. You gotta make sure you protect the ballot box. Great, moving on to the next question. Let's go to the hand at the, right at the back here actually in the, the middle. There, yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks so much for coming out, Senator Strange. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, speaking from the perspective of a, a former state attorney general yourself, um, uh, do you think the criticism, the frequent criticism that President Trump has levied against your, your predecessor, uh, Jeff Sessions, as attorney general for recusing himself from the Russia investigation has been, has been fair? Well, that's a tough spot for Jeff. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he'd agree with that. <laughs> And that puts me in a tough spot because the president actually, one conversation I had with him, he said, uh, how am I doing in Alabama? I said, you're doing fine, Mr. President. You know, you're very popular. And he uh, said, but I have to tell you, Mr. President, Jeff Sessions is very popular too. And uh, you're both the most, you're both very popular. And the people of Alabama don't really, um, they're not comfortable with your being uh, crossways with Jeff, they like him and they like you and they don't like it that you argue. But the fact is that the, um, 
I think uh, Jeff had to recuse himself. Whether or not he should have taken the appointment, that's another issue. But once he took it, uh, he was advised by the professional uh, staff at the Justice Department to take uh, to, to recuse himself. Now the president has never gotten over that because he feels like this whole Russia collusion issue that you've read a lot about was uh, made up, is not valid. I don't think that uh, the special prosecutor who's investigating that will turn up anything. We'll see. It should be coming out after the election now, and we'll see if there was anything to it. I don't believe there will be, but I think it's very difficult, and I expect that you'll see that Jeff Sessions will leave the government after uh, the elections, uh, because you do have to have an independent attorney general in terms of representing the law and the Justice Department, but he also should be some person who gets along well with the president. And I think that Jeff's time will probably come uh, to an end after this election. But he's been a good attorney general, in my opinion, because he's actually done things that, uh, that needed to be done in terms of just restoring the rule of law in several areas. And he's done a, a very good job there. Moving on to the next question. Let's go to the, hand, the, the last hand at the very back on the aisle. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming and speaking uh, this evening. And thank you for your comments and observations on the Obama's administration, specifically his use of executive orders. And I was just curious with that observation in mind, if you had any comment on President Trump's announcement today that he was interested in revoking by executive order birthright citizenship. I just saw that, and that's very interesting. You. You know, uh, on the age, use of AGs, the, in, in our time uh, as attorneys general, when I was attorney general, we were in Washington out of power. So the thing that we looked at was, is the government exceeding its authority? Now, as you might expect, the Democrats are in, uh, are in the same boat that we were in. They're facing a Republican government. And so the Democratic AGs are suing uh, the Obama administration, I mean, the Trump administration, as they start to roll back some of those things. So they've taken a page out of our book. That particular case you're talking about um, was just announced by the president today, and the, our Constitution provides that if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen. So you would think on its face that it would be very difficult for him to do that. Uh, however, there's a school of thought that uh, what that means is if you're born in the United States, but you're in the United States legally. So you've come in uh, through the normal process. You're lawfully in the United States. You have a child, that child then has, has citizenship. If you're in the United States illegally, if you're snuck in or if you're not there uh, through the proper channels, then maybe it doesn't apply. That'll be the argument that they make. And I think the president has made this proposal because it's a way to settle the issue. And sometimes you need to do that. If there's an uncertainty about an issue, uh, propose it, let it be litigated in the courts. And that's exactly the purpose of the courts, is where there's an uncertainty in the law to uh, establish it. And uh, so I expect as soon as he proposes that, he'll be sued immediately, and it'll start going through that process. Uh, just like, as you recall, the so-called Muslim ban that uh, was initially proposed when the president came into office, that was immediately challenged. And uh, that's the great thing about our separation of powers in the United States. You have a check on each branch checks itself. And uh, I'll say this, I know our time's coming to an end, but that's, you wonder why the most recent confirmation battle uh, over Brett Kavanaugh was so important and so significant and caused such emotion in the United States is because over time our checks and balance system in the legislature versus the courts has gotten a little out of balance so that the Senate and the House of Representatives have passed on a number of issues that are very important to society. It could have to do with religious liberty, it could have to do with uh, women's reproductive rights, abortion for example, things that would normally be expected and in the UK and other parts of the world have been decided by people and their representatives are decided by the courts. And so Kavanaugh's seat, the seat Kavanaugh was being confirmed for, was the swing, so-called swing vote. For conservatives, for liberals, he would be in the middle and it would tilt it to the conservative side. So that's why it became probably more contested than any Supreme Court seat in American history because of that, uh, what was perceived to be in the balance of that vote. So 
watch the court system too, and we'll see how it goes as soon as they are sued on that particular initiative. We'll take one final question from the audience. Um, let's go to the uh, hand in the third row here, gentleman in the coat. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, you finally used the word obstructionist, uh, sounding to strange in the last three minutes of uh, Stephen's questions, which of course was first introduced by uh, Newt Gingrich in observing the divide between de Democrats and Republicans, deciding that as long as they, if you allow me to recall, um, collaborated together, Republicans would never have a chance of um, receiving any kind of power. So um, can you offer your thoughts on the idea that um, as long as the current electoral systems or institutional rules remain in place, we will constantly have this divide and division between Democrats and Republicans, um, and it will only get worse. Um, the rhetoric will still increase, um, and there will never be a healing and constructive coming together, as you say, um, because people have now realized that the electoral system just doesn't favor it. Well, you point out a great point about this, the, the systemic problems with the, the, the system where we're getting through redistricting and other things that get us more into our corners. But I think that it'll ultimately be up to the people of our country, of the United States, to decide what they want. They are in control. And I think um, you'll find the system was built, of course, to allow for obstructionism. The whole point of the House of Representatives with its two-year terms um, and based on population was to be the fiery place where people came with their emotions and the issue of the day, immigration or whatever it was, would be hotly debated. Then it would go over to the Senate where it was intentionally slowed down through six year terms, you know, one third, one third staggered. Uh, so there wouldn't be the passions of the people directly. What Thomas Jefferson called the saucer, cooling saucer for the, for the hot tea. And uh, so that's always been built into the system, obstructionism. But I think uh, the question will be partly decided after these elections. If the, and nobody's asked me for prediction, which is great. Nobody's asked me to predict what's gonna happen. But in the House of Representatives, I think the Senate will be continued to con be controlled by the Republicans in, in the United States Senate and probably pick up one or two seats. Um, uh, House of Representatives is, is, is a toss up right now depends on the mood of the day next week, but, and turn out, you know, whether the Democrats, as you pointed out, like in, in Alabama, are, are motivated. Do they really feel that, that motivated to get out and vote? And you'll see some of that in Texas and other states where it's got a lot of attention. Uh, but if the Democrats do take the House of Representatives, they'll be, uh, you'll see, I, I'll, I'll use the word obstruction, but they'll be stop everything the president's doing investigate everything that he's been doing, and they have the power to investigate. So it'll be a massive gridlock of investigations and, and, and so forth. But it also creates an opportunity because President Trump likes to get things done. And let's just pick an issue like uh, infrastructure. America has a terrible problem with infrastructure that needs to be restored and rebuilt. That's not a Republican Democratic issue. That's a money issue and a regional issue. And so it's very likely to me, and it, very uh, conceivable to me that President Trump would get into deal mode, you know, the apprentice mode or whatever it is, and come out and say, look, let's make a deal, Democrats. You want roads here, I want roads there. You like to raise taxes, I'm willing to put up with a few taxes to build roads, and we can compromise. That could easily happen uh, on an issue like that. And those are the issues that the people care about when it comes down to it, uh, is their health care and the roads, schools, security, good. And right now in America, the economy is good. We're not at war. Uh, it's relatively peaceful in our country. Um, although we're in a terribly, uh, you know, um, at least in the rhetorical side, a bad place with some of the things that have happened recently. And uh, I hope as I leave you uh, here is that we'll, uh, this will be a fever that will break. And we'll, uh, the institutions that the geniuses who learn so much from this country uh, who put together our system in America were right in creating these checks and balances and freedom of the press and all these things. They've endured through an awful lot and I'm sure that they will, I feel very, very confident they were gonna continue uh, to endure for a long time. So thank you very much again. Well, that, for that note of optimism and that insightful prediction is a fantastic note to conclude on. So thank you very much for coming thank to join us. Thank you so much.